So thank you all so much for joining us to explore Connecticut's historic gardens, 15 historic sites with historically significant gardens, including historic New England's Roseland Cottage, have joined to form Connecticut's historic gardens. These delightful places offer visitors an opportunity to explore a variety of garden styles and time periods. In today's virtual program, we're going to explore the history and beauty of these gardens that have charmed and inspired visitors for a century or more. And this program is led by Lori. Oh boy, Lori. I'm now now I'm now I'm all in my mind. You're on your own, Robert. <laughs> Lori, I wrote this down phonetically. I'm still gonna get it wrong. Mashandaro. Mashandaro. She is uh, the site manager for Historic New England's aforementioned Roseland Cottage. And we again thank the uh, friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. So all 120 who are watching live and the many more that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Lori for joining us today. And Lori, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And I'm delighted somebody's tuned in from Portland, Oregon. I'm a Northwesterner myself from uh, Washington State. So what a wonderful, uh, diverse group you have today. Well, I'll say my name again. I don't want to dwell on it, but my name is Lori Mashandaro. I'm on the board of Connecticut's Historic Gardens. And today I'd just like to give you a brief look at our gardens and hope to entice you to visit. Historic Gardens was founded 19 years ago when nine historically significant sites with gardens decided we wanted to increase the awareness of the historic gardens in Connecticut. Since that time, we've grown, and since I sent you uh, the information, Robert, we've grown to 16 gardens. Collectively, we represent four centuries of gardening in Connecticut. And a good day to visit any of our gardens is Connecticut's Historic Gardens Day. This year, it's June 25th from 12 to 4. All of our 16 gardens will be open that day, and each one will offer some kind of special garden-centric program. So before we dive into the gardens, let's just take a minute to discuss the notion of a historic garden. We're certainly more used to using the word preservation when we talk about structures, but gardens represent a special kind of historic restoration or preservation. But they can change every year, every season, every day, and to the sharp-eyed gardener, every hour. They're constantly evolving, continually changing. There's no finished product. I don't need to tell the gardeners among you that. But most likely there is a period when each garden reaches its peak. The plantings have reached their maturity and the garden matches the vision of the designer. And that peak, fluid as it is, is what we try to capture in our gardens when restoring and preserving. So gardens by their nature leave us with special questions. Is it possible to preserve something in flux? If it is possible, should a garden remain locked in time or should it improve and mature? Should it reflect changing tastes and expectations or maintain its historical appearance? So I think that each one of you should go home tonight and ponder those questions. But we at Connecticut's Historic Gardens have decided to favor preservation in order to share with the public a slice of Connecticut's gardening history. So how do we decide which gardens become historic gardens in Connecticut? Well, I don't wanna to be too obvious, but first you have to have a garden. And that garden must be a domestic garden, not a park, one linked to a historic house or other significant domestic structure. And I think we can all agree the structure in this slide is pretty significant. The garden should be significant historically, either because it's the work of an important garden designer, or it represents a certain era or style or philosophy of gardening, or it accompanies a significant historic site. Sometimes all three of those apply. And your garden to be a member of Connecticut's historic gardens must be open for the public to visit. Most of the gardens that we'll see today were located, were originally installed and located on estates of the very wealthy, 
but they still exist today because of the dedicated work of the volunteers who assist each garden's professional gardener. And I, just as an aside, I'm looking out my window and I'm seeing our volunteers and gardener install the 5,000 annuals we put in every year at Rosen Cottage. So this is a very timely uh, presentation. You might note as we go through some of the gardens, as I noted when I was putting together this uh, presentation, that the story of Connecticut's historic gardens highlights women's roles in Connecticut's story. We have colonial women who were producing food, medicine, herbs, and flowers, a successful female industrialist, a woman architect. In fact, she was the fourth registered female architect in the country. She was also a loving daughter. If there's anybody joining us from Connecticut, you may know whom I'm speaking of. We have a cash-strapped turn-of-the-century woman who influenced the course of American art, a famous author, a woman who helped victims of Nazi camps. Many of the gardens were designed by women who were among the first female practitioners in the decidedly man's world of landscape architecture. Women played a significant role in Connecticut gardening history, and they still do. And I know from my own observation, looking right out my window right now, that most of the volunteers who help with our gardens are female. So all of you men out there, get out to a garden and volunteer, and we'll try to balance the scales a little bit. So that's enough talk. Let's get on to the gardens. And because we know gardeners are kind of unconventional and numbers mean nothing, we're going to start with number three on our map, the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Around the turn of the century, Miss Florence Griswold decided to turn her late Georgian home, which she'd inherited from her sea captain father, into a boarding house that became a favorite spot for summers for a budding group of American Impressionist artists. And the self-styled Lyme art colony was born. Artists flocked to Miss Florence's by 1910 to pass the summer and paint the surroundings. They enjoyed the art atmosphere there and the company of other artists, but they especially enjoyed the picturesque scenery on the Lieutenant River. Child Hossam called the spot a place for high thinking and low living. We're gonna give him the benefit of the doubt and assume that by low living, he meant room and board at a very reasonable cost. In 1998, it was decided to recreate Miss Florence's garden. The boundaries and walkways were discovered through an archeological dig and the garden was recreated to its 1910 appearance. The restorers were helped by one of the only primary resources that Florence Griswold has, and those were the artist's paintings of the site. This is on the Piazza by William Chadwick. And here we're looking back towards the piazza. This is the reverse viewpoint. This is Edward Grayson's, Edward Grayson's The Old Garden. And I've included it to show how uh, in deciding, uh, on one of the things that uh, the restorers used in deciding what plants to plant were these paintings. And you can see very clearly, I think, from this painting and this picture, how the color palette uh, from the painting was used to establish some of the paintings there. Miss Florence herself was a keen gardener. Her letters reference garden books, seed catalogs, and she was always searching for new and unusual plants. She helped others establish their own gardens with what she called good old fashioned flowers. She once referred to her garden as a veritable tangle of fragrant beauty. Today, we might characterize her garden as a grandmother's garden. Masses of flowers are informally arranged. They're bordered beds close to the home. Flocks, hollyhocks, foxglove, and daylilies are among the many perennials that make up her garden. Occasionally, a vegetable finds its way into the flower garden, but you can see it's treated with the same respect and tender loving care that the flowers get. Recreating the gardens allowed the museum to recapture a sense of place and provide a sensorial understanding of why so many artists found and still find inspiration at this riverside setting. That is the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut, a garden that inspired the very best of American Impressionist painters. <music> 
Next, we'll visit the Thankful Arnold House in Haddam, Connecticut. The Thankful Arnold House was built in 1795 and was home to Joseph and Thankful Arnold. Today, the house and gardens provide a glimpse of the life of the widow Thankful Arnold in the late 1820s, shortly after her husband's early death. In the late 1980s, the garden was recreated uh, with granite edged beds and gravel paths. In the year 2000, using research provided by the Connecticut Herb Study Group, plants commonly grown in household gardens in the lower Connecticut River Valley in the 1830s were planted. Most of the garden is now devoted to herbs used for cooking, medicine, dyeing, fragrance, and other household uses. There's a small bed that features a rotating collection of vegetables common to the era and a few old fashioned annuals. You can see that the Thankful Arnold Garden is well used by school programs. Now, Thankful's garden would have been much larger, much simpler, and frankly, much messier than the Thankful Arnold Garden today but it reminds us of the enormous importance of herbs and other plants in daily life during the colonial and early federal era. Trained physicians and druggists were scarce. Every prudent housewife had a collection of formulas for dyes and medicines and other household necessities. The garden has been recognized by the National Home Gardening Club and featured in an issue of People, Places and Plants magazine. Like most of our gardens, the Arnold House Garden is overseen by a group of dedicated volunteers. We're lucky in Connecticut to have three gardens designed by landscape architect Beatrix Farrand. All three of those gardens are members of Connecticut's historic gardens. Farrand was the niece of author Edith Wharton and equally respected in landscape architecture. She synthesized an American style and was one of the great landscape designers uh, at, at the turn of the century. She was known for a combination of plant colors and textures, an ability to blend the formal with the informal, the native with the cultivar, and the human scaled garden with the wilder landscape beyond. And all of these characteristics are in the gardens that she designed in Connecticut. Um, I don't wanna give a plug to Amazon Prime, uh, their streaming service, but PBS put together a documentary on the life of Beatrix Farrand a few years ago. It's called Beatrix Farrand's American Landscape. And now it's available on Amazon Prime and I highly recommend it. Farrand was one of the great uh, landscape designers uh, in, in, in our times. And she continues to influence today's garden designers. The first Farrand garden we'll visit is Harkness Memorial State Park in Waterford. The gardens at Harkness surround a summer home, the 1907 Italian at Mansion, once owned by philanthropists Edward and Mary Stillman Harkness. They named their summer home Aeolia, which some people translate as, as winds of the gods. And you can see that it's on a bluff overlooking Long Island Sound with panoramic views of the sound. Originally, the gardens at Harkness were designed by a Boston firm which it seemed lacked sufficient pizzazz for Mary Harkness because 10 years later, she brought in Beatrix Ferrand to redo part of the landscape, a tennis court. I guess the Harknesses were willing to give up one of their two tennis courts to a garden. Ferrand transformed the tennis court into an intimate sunken garden known now as the Asian or East Garden. Inspired perhaps by Mrs. Harkness's extensive collection of Asian statuary. The gardens are planted with baby's breath, lavender, lilies and roses, delphinium, and ornamental shrubs. A few of her pieces of statuary remain on display. And around the dog that we see here on the left and throughout this garden is heliotrope, which was Mary Harkness's favorite flower. They grow it every year at Harkness from cuttings from the original planting back in the 1910s. Mary Harkness was so happy with Ferenc's redo of the tennis court, she asked her to do the West Gardens here, parts of which after the transformation were called the Italian Garden. We're gonna zoom in right here 
to get a close look at Farron's plans. By the way, uh, Farron's papers are collected at University of California, Berkeley. And here on the right, we have the plan for this little parterre garden here. You can see, I like to juxtapose these two because you can see how closely the plan was followed in the realization of this boxwood parterre. Here are more of Farron's plans for the West Garden. She finished the job at Harkness in the 1920s, and when she finished, Harkness contained an Italian garden, a boxwood parterre, which we just looked at, and a wild-looking alpine rockery in addition to the East Garden. Here's another look at the West Garden. You can see the sound there in the distance. And here's some of the beautiful original ironwork that is still uh, on display there at Harkness. This is an old photo of the greenhouses at Harkness. And, and, and I included it, first of all, because it's just like old photos. And secondly, because they have restored a portion of it and it's back in use at Harkness just, I think, two or three years ago. But mainly to show you the scale of the gardening that went on at Harkness back in the day. There were 40 gardeners that tended uh, the Harkness Harkness Gardens back when the Harknesses spent the summers there. Here's the iconic photograph of the Harkness Gardens, the pergola that borders the Italian gardens with the beautiful wisteria. The gardens were restored in the 1990s and now they're maintained by volunteers, the Friends of Harkness, along with seasonal state workers. That is the Harkness Museum, which I like to think of as a Newport style mansion but with much better gardens than any of the Newport houses have. Next, we'll go down the road to Weir Farm in Wilton. It's a national park site. In fact, it's the only national park site that's devoted to painting. Weir Farm was home to three generations of American artists, but it's remembered now as the summer home of renowned American Impressionist Julian Alden Weir, who in 1882 acquired the 153 acre farm in exchange for a painting and $10. Over the years, Weir and his family transformed the farm's landscape to suit their aesthetic tastes. This is one of Weir's paintings. His youngest daughter, Cora, was passionate about gardening. She was trained in landscape design and horticulture and designed several of Weir Farm's historic gardens, including the iconic terraced gardens. Those gardens were restored using Cora's family photos to identify plant types and locations. New plantings incorporated existing plant remnants such as peony, yucca, spring and summer bulbs and other hardy herbs. Over the years, the gardens became a significant and endearing part of this rural setting. Now they're a popular spot for plein air painting and picnicking, which are both activities that are encouraged at Weir Farms. This is the sunken garden designed by Cora in the 1930s. It's designed by a stone wall and curving flower beds that are edged with dwarf boxwood, irises, peonies, and bleeding hearts. At Weir Farm, there's also a secret garden that dates back to, the to 1915. It became the secret garden because the Dutzia hedge around this garden became so overgrown that it hid the garden and that made the perfect hidden garden for the Weirs. That is Weir Farm, a national park dedicated to painting. Next, we'll visit the Osborne Homestead Museum in Derby. It has the distinction of having the longest name of any of our gardens. It's the Osborne Homestead Museum and Kellogg Environmental Center, Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. It's quite a mouthful. It's a Greek revival style house that was originally built around 1840 and was home to Civil War veteran and industrialist Wilbur Fisk Osborne and his wife, Ellen Lucy Davis. Their youngest and only surviving child, Francis, shown here resplendent in a sequin gown, inherited the estate when she was 31. She was a pioneering businesswoman in an era when women were denied leadership opportunities in what was considered a man's world. She succeeded through pure determination and an excellent business sense, she tells us. She expanded the family business and became president of Union Fabric Company, 
vice president of Connecticut Clasp, and was a founder of Steels and Busks Limited in England. Around 1910, Florence began major, major renovations to the home. In 1919, she married a New York architect, Waldo Stewart Kellogg. And every time I say that, I feel like there's something backwards about that. I probably would have married the architect first and then begun uh, uh, alterations on the home. But in 1910, Francis started alterations on the home. This is a survey of the property that was done then probably because of the remodeling. So the five beds that you see in the plan kind of center uh, left there date back to at least 1911. They're filled with annuals, the border bed with a mix of daylilies, iris, peonies, yucca, and a variety of perennials. And that brick path invites you to follow it through the arbor and into another section or room of the garden with four rectangular beds. They're planted with rose bushes, daisies, and annual salvia surrounded by a boxwood border. Perennials, hostas, astilbes, iris, globe thistle, foxglove, and fern are planted along the lattice. And the lattice that you see here in the arch are the devices of the colonial revival garden. The gardener at the Osborne homestead uses that 1911 plan and old images of the garden, again, like at Florence Griswold, uh, paintings are used to aid in garden design. Before her death in 1956, Mrs. Osborne Kellogg gave her 350 acre property to the state of Connecticut to form Osborne Dale State Park. The site is richly landscaped with formal gardens, ornamental and flowering trees, and the grounds provide visitors with an endless pageant of color from spring through autumn. That is the Osborne Homestead in Derby, Connecticut, a successful female industrialist's gift to the people of Connecticut. Next, a little northwest to Promisic at Three Rivers Farm in Bridgewater. Promisic is our only site that is not a museum. It's a retreat center, uh, an environmental preserve and model for how we can all creatively take responsibility for the health of the planet we share. It maintains an important historic garden that's open to the public for limited visits. It will be open July, uh, June 25th for Connecticut's Historic Gardens Day. So if any of you are gonna venture into Connecticut for Historic Gardens Day, I feel a little disloyal saying this, but it's a great day to visit Promisic because it's open that day. If you wanna see Promisic because it's, it's an important garden, it's one of the Farron Gardens, uh, and you can't be there on the 25th, if you call, the staff will do their very best to mesh their schedule with yours so that they can get you in to see our second Beatrix Farrand garden. In 1921, uh, Farrand was asked by Dr. Frederick Peterson to design the garden there. Peterson was a renowned neurologist responsible for more humane treatment of people suffering from mental illness. He incorporated occupational therapy like gardening and music into their care. He used the 300 acre property known as Three River Farms to entertain friends, family, and clients. This is a picture of the garden in uh, 1931 after Farrand had installed her design, but the story of the garden at Promisic is of a garden rediscovered. The Promisic group purchased the property in 1978, long after the Petersons owned it. And you can see on the left there, on the far left is Beatrix Farrand. Mrs. Peterson is on the right in that group. In 1978, when Promisic purchased the property, the walled garden had been overtaken by decades of overgrowth and had been forgotten. But the hardscape remained. It was rediscovered in 1992. Pamela Edwards, a garden historian, noticed a listing for a Beatrix Farrand garden owned by a Dr. Peterson in the Bridgewater area. The Promisic members and volunteers cleared the brush to reveal the flagstone and stone walls and using the UC Berkeley plans set to work restoring Farrand's original vision. Here is the restored garden 
Every effort is made to stick to the original plan. But like all of us who work with historic gardens know, well, we all face a similar challenge. Um, surrounding trees mature, there's more shade that might uh, attract different pests. So substitutions are made uh, using every effort to maintain the garden with some of Farron's favorite plants, matching the color, bloom time, height, and texture of Farron's original plan whenever possible. The beds along the stone wall perimeter contain perennials in pink, purple, white, and blue. The inside beds feature roses in pinks and reds. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. There's the garden. There's some of the uh, inside beds. More of the inside beds, which feature roses in pinks and reds, edged with a lacy fringe of fragrant annuals. That is promising, or transla translated from the native Putatak, land that goes on forever. And on to Glebe House Museum in Woodbury, Connecticut. This 18th century farmhouse in historic Woodbury Center is considered the birthplace of the Episcopal Church in this hemisphere. The first bishop of the Episcopal Church uh, was elect the first elected bishop in this hemisphere was elected here at Glebe House, which is what gives it that reputation as the uh, birthplace of the Episcopal Church. It passed through several owners and by 1920 was scheduled to be demolished. Instead, it was purchased and restored, opening as a house museum in 1925, which makes it one of the oldest house museums in the country. When opened, the organizers wanted to offer visitors a new garden, so they turned to Englishwoman Gertrude Jekyll, who's perhaps the best known gardener of the times, and she provided a plan. But the plan was lost and forgotten, and the garden was never planted. But in the 1970s, a student at UC Berkeley, where Jekyll's plan had wound up, along with the, obviously they collect uh, several gardener's plans, uh, but a student at UC Berkeley, where the plan had landed, noticed a Jekyll plan for a garden at a Glebe house in Connecticut and called to ask to come see it. This is one of my favorite stories because I, I can just imagine how shocked the person who answered the phone was when the student at UC Berkeley said, hi, I just found out you have a, a Gertrude Jekyll garden. I'd really like to come see it. And they went, what? We don't have a Jekyll garden. So it was kind of the impetus to reinstall or to installing the Jekyll garden. Here is uh, the plan. And in the late 1980s, the decision was made to install the garden. So it is the only remaining garden in America designed by England's premier designer. Today, the garden contains 600 feet of classic English style mixed borders in Jekyll's characteristic color schemes running from cold or white and blue, her cold colors, to her hot colors, the oranges and reds, and then back to the cold colors again. Now, this year and last year, Gleep House is undergoing a major restoration, uh, bringing everything back uh, it's been 50 years since the garden was installed, so they're bringing things back to that original uh, Jekyll plan. And to answer the burning question, I know you all have. Yes. Despite the fact that it's pronounced Jekyll rather than Jekyll, there is a connection between her and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Gertrude's brother, Walter, was a friend of Robert Louis Stevenson. And Robert Louis Stevenson may have borrowed his name for his famous and at the same time infamous character. So that is Glebe House and Gertrude Jekyll Garden in Woodbury. Next, we'll visit the Bellamy Faraday House in Bethlehem. The house was built in 1754 for the Reverend Joseph Bellamy. Here's the house. The Reverend Bellamy was a significant figure in the First Great Awakening. And the building there, his home, was the site of the first theological school in North America. And of course, it was the Reverend Bellamy who named the town Bethlehem. But we're really more interested in the Faraday part of the name. 
In 1912, Henry, Eliza, and their daughter, Carolyn Faraday, came to Bethlehem, probably to escape the fast pace of New York City. In 1915, Eliza and her daughter, Carolyn, designed the formal Partier Garden. Tradition tells us they looked to French garden design and a favorite parlor rug. Here is Carolyn in the garden in the 1950s, after the garden had, uh, I think they started in the 19 teens. Remember, you have to be patient to be a gardener. Here is her garden today. Hundreds of perennials, including peonies, roses, foxglove, cranesbills, and lilac make up the garden at Bellamy Faraday. And the lilacs have taken on a special meaning at Bellamy Faraday. Martha Hall Kelly, while touring the house, noticed a black and white photograph of a group of women. And she asked the guide about it. And she learned that that photograph was of women who had been prisoners in a Nazi camp where uh, medical experiments were conducted. And Carolyn took up their cause at the end of the war. Kelly wanted to tell uh, Carolyn's story and the best-selling Lilac Girls was born. Uh, it's a, I, I imagine that many of you have read Lilac Girls. It's the story of Carolyn and, and these women who were in Ravensbrück concentration camp that she helped after the war. Uh, it was on the bestseller list for a long time. And there was another book came out and it has roses in the title. I don't remember the whole title, but it is about Eliza uh, Faraday, uh, Carolyn's mother. So that is the Bellamy Faraday House and Garden, an inspirational country retreat. Hillstead is our third Beatrix Farron designed garden. The story of Hillstead is an interesting one, and I think it's a great place to take your kids, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Like so many of our gardens, it reflects uh, women's history here in Connecticut. Theodate Pope was the daughter of a wealthy industrialist and one of the first women architects in the country. She designed Hillstead as a retirement home for her parents. And when you take your children there, that's what you want to stress. This was a gift, a retirement gift to Theodate's parents. It was built in the colonial revival style and completed in 1901. It served and serves as a showcase for the family's furnishings, decorative arts, and significant collection of French Impressionist paintings. Again, paintings and gardens, not a surprise, I don't think. It includes miles of stone walls, uh, Theodate transplanted mature trees. There's a walking garden, a working dairy and orchard, a pollinator garden, but our focus is the sunken garden, which is in a natural depression contained by walls of largely dry laid native stone. Within the depression is the octagonal garden of 36 beds framed by a low hedge. Here's an early picture of Theodate's mother in the garden when the garden was new. But in the 19 teens, when Theodate wanted to redesign the garden, it was natural for her to turn to Beatrix Farron, who was working on the Harkness estate. Remember, we talked about that. She was just finishing up on the Harkness estate. But, but uh, Theodate, who is now Theodate Riddle after she married, and Beatrix Farron had been introduced before uh, any work was undertaken at Harkness. They'd been introduced by novelist and mutual acquaintance, Henry James. Farron's challenge at Hillstead was to develop a plan to transform the formal plantings into something structured yet informal. Plants along the brick path start as low fragrant swirls of annual verbena, heliotrope, and lavender around the summer house. They increase in height and radiate outward, concluding with stands of rue, giant Solomon seal, Boltania, and lilies. Visitors are greeted with drifts of bloom in blue, pink, salmon, and white, and varied texture foliage in grays and greens. And these are all the very colors and textures that Farrand is known for. Some believe, again, that her color palette was inspired by Theodate's French Impressionist paintings at Hillstead. And just like the Grayson painting that we looked at at uh, Florence Griswold, this is a Monet painting that hangs in the house. And I believe you can see how the color palette is reflected 
in, in the flowers that are planted in the garden. When Theodate died in 1946, Hillstead became a museum in accordance with her wishes. At that time, as is true of so many of America's formal gardens, the sunken garden had been planted over. In the mid 1980s, two garden clubs raised money to restore the garden. They had found the original planting plan for the garden after reading the same book on Farron that the folks at Promisic read. And just like the documentary I spoke of earlier, the book is called Beatrix Farron's American Landscape, and it's still in print. Or it's, it was reissued in, in 1985, and that edition is still in print. The original design was obtained from the Farron archives at UC Berkeley. The garden at Hillstead attempts to reproduce this planting as accurately as possible. This is the Hillstead Museum, which stands for Homestead on a Hill, designed for parents to retire to. Also in Farmington and just literally right around the corner from Hillstead is the Stanley Whitman House, which is our oldest house in Connecticut's historic gardens. It was built in 1720. Women and children were responsible for the kitchen garden that was planted close to the house. The dooryard garden features raised narrow beds so you can work from both sides of the beds. And those Stanley Whitman's paths are now quite wide for the comfort of the modern visitor. Back in the day, they would have been no more than a foot wide, leaving more space for planting. The plants in the 18th century garden were all known to have been cultivated in the colonies at that time. Included are small fruits, medicinal and culinary herbs and flowers and vegetables. I don't know about you, but those are look to me like huge carrots and very fine uh, beets. So either the soil is extraordinary at Stanley Whitman, or maybe it's the gardeners who are. The apple orchard was replanted in 1986, adding, an, adding to the ambiance of this 18th century home site. That same year, archeological work pinpointed the likely location of the door garden through pollen analysis that was undertaken by Yukon professor Rudy Favretti, who was known really internationally for his historic uh, landscape uh, work and design. The gardens were installed after a years long study. And it reminds us again, as did Thankful Arnold's, how important home gardens and orchards were in the colonial era, both for food, but also for herbs and medicine. That is the Stanley Whitman House in Farmington, one of the oldest houses in Connecticut. Next, we'll go down to Nook Farm in Hartford at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. Uh, it was an urban garden at Nook Farm and Nook Farm was a literary colony during the latter half of the 19th century. Of course, Harriet Beecher Stowe is best known as the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. She purchased the painted brick cottage on Forest Street in Hartford in 1873. So that's well after she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. She lived there for 20 years with her husband Calvin, Calvin and their adult twin daughters. Harriet was an avid gardener. She believed, and maybe some of us still do believe, in the healing power of gardens. According to the Stowe Center, the gardens there are a combination of inspiration, interpretation, and reproduction. Some of the plantings are historical, and new plantings based on what is known to have been planted there before are always being added. Here's the high Victorian garden with elephant ears, castor bean plants, and coleus. All of these were kind of exotic plants in the Victorian era, and Victorians loved to have those kinds of exotic plants. They were unusual and required extra maintenance, and they were really a status symbol for people who could grow uh, these exotic plants like coleus. And they were an indication of wealth and sophistication. We're told Harriet took a rather relaxed approach to her gardens. In fact, she referred to them as her jungles. But my guess is she really didn't let them go too wide. Like other Victorians, she connected gardening to morality. Nice grounds signified that nice people lived in the house there. And we actually see this in Uncle Tom's cabin. 
One let way of letting the reader know that Tom, an enslaved person, was a man of high moral standing was the fact that he kept a good garden. Harriet creates an aura of virtuous domesticity and helps her readers identify with the enslaved heroes of her novel. She uses the flowers to humanize her characters. The Stowe and Day House next door are known for Garden Club of America's award-winning heritage roses. And I'd like to take just a minute to show you a contemporary ex exhibition garden that was at the Stowe Center, I believe until last year. Uh, may still be there. Um, it's called The Solitary Garden. It's an art installation six feet by nine feet, which is the same size as the cell Albert Woodfax was confined in for 43 years for a crime he did not commit. I include this to show how gardens can, in addition to being places of repose and beauty, uh, can be used to raise awareness and make powerful statements. And I also want to emphasize the important work that the Stowe Center does promoting social justice and positive change. That is the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center cottage gardening on a domestic scale. And the wonderful thing now about a visit to the Stowe Center at Nook Farms is that in addition to the Stowe House and Gardens, and just a few feet away, is our newest member of Connecticut's Historic Gardens. They've only been in Historic Gardens, I think, for just maybe three months, is the Mark Twain House. The Mark Twain House has lots of gardens to visit, but the one considered historic is this recently installed turnaround garden. So let me explain turnaround to you. Notice the porte cochere center right in this picture, on the right edge of the picture. So a coach would pull up, drop off its occupants who could, uh, even if it was raining, enter the house under the porte cochere and avoid the rain. And the carriage would drive down towards us and drive around the round garden there. That's why it's called a turnaround. And they could head out the same way they came in. I want to show you how close the Stowe House and the Mark Twain House are. You can see if you look uh, a little bit to the right in the background, the Stowe Center sign and the Stowe House is that gray house that you see in the background. And the solitary garden is just to the right of the Stowe sign there. So Stowe Center and Mark Twain House, think of it as a two for one. Next, we'll stay in Hartford and visit the Butler McCook House and Garden, right on Hartford's Main Street. It's the oldest remaining house in Hartford, built in 1782, and the same family lived there for nearly 200 years. We're going to take a look really at the garden behind the house is where our interest is, and you can see it's really a retreat from Main Street. It's a restored Victorian garden. Here's the design. Uh, from 1865. You, know, you can juxtapose and see how they uh, realize the garden slightly differently than uh, the design that we see on the right. This is the only surviving domestic garden of pioneer landscape architect Jacob Weidenman. He also designed and built Bushnell Park in Hartford, Cedar Hill Cemetery, one of the monumental cemeteries uh, so common from that era. It's in Hartford. And he collaborated with Frederick Law Olmsted on the Capitol grounds in Washington, D.C. and Mount Royal Park in Montreal. It's a parterre garden. Hmm. Why aren't we switching here? I'll try my second method of switching. It's a parterre garden bordered by hedges featuring roses and peonies. And you can see that now it's a thoroughly urban garden, a real oasis in downtown Hartford. That is the Butler McCook Garden, House and Garden in Hartford. We'll go just south of Hartford to the Webb Dean Stevens Museum in Wethersfield, where George Washington really did sleep in 1781. The Webb Dean Stevens houses, there are three houses there, they're owned by the Colonial Danes. The garden is behind the Webb House in Old Wethersfield. It was built, or the garden was installed in 1921. 
the dames hired Amy Cogswell to design the garden to complement the tea room they ran at the Webb House. In 1921, professionally designed gardens were rare. In fact, the only thing rarer than a professionally designed garden was one that was designed by a professionally uh, by a professional landscape designer who was a woman. Amy Cogswell was a graduate from the first American institution for women studying in this field, the Lowthorpe School of Landic Landscape Architecture and Horticulture. Unlike their colonial predecessors, think of Thankful Arnold and the Stanley Whitman House with herbs and medicinal plants and utilitarian plantings, colonial revival gardens are purely decorative and contain quaint arbors and a host of old fashioned flowers, mainly hardy perennials like phlox, roses, and a few brightly colored, um, few brightly colored annuals. Cogswell's plan called for 99 different plants, including hollyhocks, larkspur, foxglove, and peonies. From 1921 to around 1940, the Webb House and Garden was carefully maintained. But World War II brought few visitors and the colonial dames began making adjustments to make care easier. As early as 1945, their records note that the plan was disappearing. And by the 1970s, very little of Amy Cogswell's design was left. But to the delight of the colonial dames and the Webb Dean Stevens staff, the original plan for the garden was found in the museum's archives in 1996, and a decision was made to originate the original Cogswell garden. So it's not an exact replica, but the garden does maintain an authentic appearance, displaying many of the same flowers that visitors enjoyed in the 1920s. And I know they're always working to include more of the Cogswell plan in the garden now. That is the Webb Dean Stevens Museum in Wethersfield, Connecticut, and Amy Cogswell Colonial Revival Garden. We'll go north now to the Phelps Hathaway House in Suffield. This garden was installed in 1964 by Hartford landscape architect, Mary Wells Edwards. Here's a view of the garden from the second floor of the house. We're told that she was inspired by historic wallpaper in the house. Here's Edward's plan. And here with some samples of the designs on the wallpaper, which I think are reflected in some of the sweeping shapes and lines of the garden design. It was Edward's intention to combine early Dutch formality and late 19th century free design. And the garden features pink and white peonies, some of which are over 150 years old. So clearly some of those peonies predate Edward's uh, garden there. That is the Phelps Hathaway House in Suffield. So I hope I've given you an idea of how beautiful our historic gardens are in Connecticut. I think it's really quite a striking and informative group, but I would be less than honest if I didn't admit that there's one that's closest to my heart. And that would be Roseland Cottage in Woodstock, way up, well, to us in Connecticut, it's way up in the Northeast, or what we call the quiet corner of Connecticut. Roseland's garden is beautiful in any season, but this is its more typical look. Roseland Cottage was the summer home of Henry Bowen, who was a native of Woodstock. He became a wealthy New York silk importer and publisher of an important anti-slavery newspaper, The Independent. The house and grounds are a national historic landmark, notable not just for its garden or illustrious history, but also for its striking Gothic revival architecture. The formal parterre garden was added five years after the house was built. The parterre was added in 1850. Parterre comes from a French word that you can translate as on the ground, which doesn't help very much when explaining what a parterre garden is. I think most gardens are probably on the ground, um, but it defines a flat garden in which the flower beds form a pattern. Typically, the flower beds are separated by paths. The paths are of gravel and the beds ideally are defined by boxwood. Rose, Roseland's parterre garden is the very description, the embodiment of a parterre. 
the beds form a pattern, an asymmetrical pattern, quite different from the neoclassical parterre gardens that uh, we are perhaps more familiar with. The asymmetry in this case goes along with the Gothic revival style. Uh, rather than that lovely balance, there's a sense of movement that the asymmetry uh, creates. And uh, it's considered to be more dynamic, as is the Gothic revival style. We have gravel paths. You can see our gravel paths. And we have 600 yards of dwarf English boxwood. Now, we don't know who designed the gardens at Roseland. It could have been the nurseryman, Henry Dyer. And I'm showing you this invoice. I know it's a little bit hard to read. But if you look at what's circled there, and this is why I'm showing it to you just for a little bit of fun. There were 600 yards of draft box edging, it says, for the grand total of $75. I don't know if any of you bought boxwood lately. I'm guessing you paid $75 for a little clump of boxwood. So it could have been designed by nurseryman Henry Dyer, could have been designed by the architect of the house, Joseph Wells, or it could have been designed by Henry Bowen himself. And here's a picture taken when Rosen Cottage was being built in 1846 with Bowen, his wife, Lucy. And if you look asleep on Lucy's lap, you see their first of 10 children, little Henry Elliot. Bowen's library contains several volumes on bulbs, flowers, floriculture, gardening, and landscaping. We do know that the entire estate, the garden, the house, the barn and outbuildings, and you have to forgive me, it's probably in my contract, I have to say this every time I talk about Roseland, the nation's oldest surviving indoor bowling alley reflects the principles of Andrew Jackson Downing. It would be hard to exaggerate the influence of Downing in the latter half of the 19th century. He wrote four books on gardening, landscape, and architecture, and they all went through multiple printings and appealed to the newly emerging middle class and their desire to appear refined. Downing stressed the interplay between house and landscape, art and nature. He didn't really like parterre gardens too much, but well, because he preferred landscapes, we're in the Romantic era, he preferred landscapes that imitated nature. But if a parterre was what you wanted, Downing said it should have irregular beds and borders. We already mentioned the asymmetry at Roseland, distinctly marked edges with our boxwood, and the beds should be planted in masses of color. Downing preferred annuals for their long blooming period. And I think I told you my volunteers and our gardener are out there right now planting some of the five to 6,000 that we put in every year. These masses of color should show well with the edging. And I think that's displayed very well in this uh, photo. And preferably, of course, the edging is boxwood. And the interplay between the house and the garden was very important to, gar to Downing. You should be able to see the garden from the house. This is from our south parlor. And in fact, the garden should seem like an extension of the house. Here's our front door at Rosen, and you can see it nearly spills into the main bed, our main oval bed, that is planted to look like a carpet in a style called ribbon or carpet planting. So you can step right out of the house and almost step right on to the carpet of the garden. No, we don't do that, but it's, but I believe that uh, helps to create that connection between the house and garden. Here's some more of the ribbon planting with Sweet Williams, which are called Old Fashioned by one of the books in Bowen's library, and some alyssum around the outside. Here's some ribbon planting with begonias, and here with petunias. Downing really liked purple petunias. He thought they were especially nice, when they're paired with a lissom, as they are in one of our gardens here. Not all of our plantings are carpet plantings. This is just one way that I can get one of our kind of late season pictures, uh, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, I can show it to you. Here again, an old photo. You know I like old photos. This is from the 1890s and shows Henry Bowen's granddaughter, Constance Holt, third generation to live in the house in the garden there. And I'm showing it to you so you can see that the layout of the garden is identical to the historic layout of the garden. 
Here's Miss Constance if she were standing in today's garden. 80% of the boxwood, by the way, that you see here is from that original planting or cuttings grown from that original planting going back to 1850. It's very rare to have a garden that so perfectly survives with its elaborate pattern intact. We have a wealth of documentation for our garden as do most of Connecticut's historic gardens. We use plant orders, receipts, correspondence, archival photos, newspaper descriptions, family scrapbooks, 19th century horticultural sources, and physical evidence of surviving plants. Oh, this is what Rosen Cottage and the garden looked like in the 1970s when the nonprofit that still maintains the house and that I, I have the pleasure to work for, Historic New England, purchased the property from the Bowen family. And you can see the pattern is still there, although the hedge has probably seen better days. Uh, our beautiful cut leaf maple is still there. Um, there was a lot of contra. There was a question about what to do with the garden at Roseland Cottage. And uh, there was a little bit of controversy as well. And I'm happy to tell you that UConn professor that I mentioned early, Rudy Favretti, came to the rescue. The controversy, a group of uh, experts from a prestigious New England university, not in Connecticut, but pretty close, suggested that the garden should be removed. It should just be torn out. It wasn't in keeping with the picturesque aesthetic of the mid 19th century. It didn't conform to Downing's natural style. And finally, it would be really expensive to maintain. Well, they were right about one thing. It is expensive to maintain. But uh, correct, it does. It's not in keeping with the picturesque, naturalist, naturalistic style garden of the mid 19th century. But it did conform to Downing's uh, writings. And in fact, Rudy Favretti, with his specialized knowledge of landscape history, really disagreed with those guys from Harvard. And he emphasized the rarity of a garden like Roseland's that's still in its original pattern with the original boxwood borders and stressed its historical significance. And he also pointed to Andrew Jackson's own writing and plans for gardens of the parterre sort that exist at Roseland. Those of us who love Roseland's parterre garden are delighted that Professor Favretti prevailed. So I do hope that you'll come visit uh, of course, in my heart of hearts, I hope you'll come visit Roseland Cottage, but all 16 of our gardens will give you a wonderful experience and slice of historic gardening in Connecticut. And at Roseland, we like to think that we are full of Victorian exuberance. So I hope our quick glimpse of the 16 historic gardens in Connecticut has piqued your curiosity and that you will come visit. When you do visit, be sure you get a brochure. Oh, I'm too blurred. Connecticut's Historic Gardens brochure. Uh, when you come visit, once you've visited three of our gardens and you get your little passport that's in the brochure stamped, we'll be happy to give you as our special gift to you for visiting our gardens, uh, a special packet of note cards that we make from the posters we commission every year. So you just need to visit three to get a set of note cards. Uh, any, and I hope you have some questions for me. So Lori, wonderful job as expected, folks. Let's give Lori a big virtual round of applause. And Lori, let's take uh, 10 minutes of questions here. An anonymous attendee asks, was thankful Arnold related to Benedict Arnold? You know, that's a really good question because Benedict Arnold is a Connecticut figure. And, and this part of Connecticut and I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to check on that. You are the first person in all of these presentations that's ever asked that. I think that's a great question. So, Lori, if I were to Google Connecticut's historic gardens, would all would a, would I get a list of all 15 or 16 gardens, or how does gardens, one yes. get a list? Uh, yeah, you, uh, we have a website, Connecticut's historic gardens, and it it lists the gardens. It lists what our criteria are for 
becoming a Connecticut garden. It tells you what we're going to do on Connecticut's Historic Gardens Day and gives you a little bit of information and a link to each site's website. Uh, Sage says that when the Wee Fairy Village is set up at Florence Griswold is a fun time to visit. She, Sage, you are absolutely correct. We Fairy oh. Village is very special and very popular there. And one of our historic New England curators actually usually provides a little house for We Fairy Village down at uh, Florence Griswold. That's in, is that in, I think it's in September, October, if I'm not so mistaken. Uh, Rosamond says this was a lovely program. Uh, Gail, Francis, and L all say thank you. Lynette says great presentation. Mary says very informative and interesting. Thank you for sharing your beautiful gardens. Uh, Shinwei says beautiful and informative program. Laura would like to know, do all the gardens charge an admissions fee? And if so, what is that fee? I do not believe to visit the garden. Uh, let me let, let me break this down a little bit. For Connecticut's Historic Gardens Day, there is no charge for visiting the garden that day. There, most of the places I believe still charge to visit the historic home, but there's no charge to visit the garden that day. Many of our gardens are open, for instance, at Roseland, our grounds are open dawn to dusk at no charge. People can come picnic here, just enjoy the garden, just walk the grounds. And that's the case with many of our gardens. Harkness is a state uh, park. So there may be a charge for parking on the weekends, but I don't believe they charge to go on into the park, but I do believe they charge for parking. So the best thing to do is to go to the individual websites, which you can find from Connecticut's Historic Gardens website and see, see what the charges are, if there are any. Diane, uh, Diane says, so well done. Thank you so much. I believe Beatrix uh, Ferrand purchased Gertrude Jekyll's papers, and that is why they, they are in the same archive in California with Beatrix's papers. Thank you so much. That ha I have always thought that was a little bit curious that uh, Jekyll's garden design showed up at UC Berkeley, just like Farron's did. Maybe. So, you, so Farron, did you say, you said Farron purchased Jekyll's designs. That's fascinating. That's right. That is really, really and interesting. If it, if it makes you feel any better, Lori, you see, I mispronounce everyone's last names, not just yours. <laughs> um, Mary, whose last name I'm not going to try, uh, says, is there a list of native plants that are in each garden? I don't believe so, Mary. That's a very good question. And we are all now, I think all of our gardens, I know I can speak for our gardener here at Roseland, are um, so much more aware of those things. We'd like to put in a separate pollinator here at Roseland as they've done at Hillstead. But because we are committed to maintaining the historic garden, like I said, I, I, you might have noticed I mentioned yucca plants several times. I don't think modern gardeners put in very many yucca plants anymore, but they are in almost all of our historic gardens, certainly not a native plant, but they're popular in the historic gardens because they were something that was a little bit exotic. So while we may not always grow native plants, and I, I know there's no list, we do try to grow. I know, for instance, we don't grow impatient very often at Rosen. We grow balsam, which is what the impatient plant was cultivated from. Natives, I think you got to go a different place really to get native plants. I'm sorry to say that. Mm -hmm. There are places in Connecticut that specialize in native plants. And many of our sites are trying to, uh, in an area that's separate from the historic gardens, uh, cultivate the native plants. It's a good mm -hmm. idea. So Mary says, thank you, this was wonderful. Judy says, great presentation, looking forward to visiting next time I'm in the area. And Nancy says, what a beautiful visit to Connecticut. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, so I think we've uh, gone through the Q&A. Uh, Lauren says she really enjoyed the rhythm of your presentation, very informative and just beautiful photos and the Zoom ins helped. So uh, Lori, uh, let's wrap it there. Uh, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? 
Thank you. And I hope if you do make it to Rosen Cottage, I will probably be here. Please remind me that we know each other from the from this uh, Zoom that we that we spent together. And so again, uh, thank you so much, Lori. Thank you to the audience for tuning in. Look for an email from me later today with a link to the recording, a link to a feedback survey, information about some other upcoming virtual programs, uh, both gardening programs and some historic New England programs. And uh, yeah, so we'll wrap it there. Thank you all. Go Celtics. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Lori. Nice to meet you. Nice to Thanks meet again. you. Thanks again.